welcome to the NDTV Dialogues, a conversation of ideas. Today we discuss the role of the classical in modern India, an idea even more relevant in today's narrative and in a week where a first of its kind initiative has been launched, the Murthy Classical Library of India. I have some of the titles right here with me, uh, these beautiful books here, translations, uh, this of course, uh, Source Ocean, Poems from the Early Tradition, translated into English, just one of the five titles that have been released. Also joining me on this, three people who feel passionately about this topic. The man who made it possible, Dr. Rohan Narayan Murthy, founder of the Murthy Classical Library. Professor Sheldon Pollock, editor of the library. He's also a professor at Columbia, a Sanskrit scholar and scholar of Indic languages. I'm also joined by Professor Manjul Bhargav from Princeton. He's a recipient of the Fields Medal in Mathematics often seen as the equivalent of a Nobel, but he's joining me tonight because of his love for Sanskrit as well as mathematics. Thank you all very much for coming in. Mr. Murthy, this has been a labor of love for the last four years and perhaps a passion that you wouldn't expect in somebody as young as you, someone who's a PhD in computer science, who's been a computer innovation fellow. Why, did you, why were you drawn to the classics and drawn to it enough to invest over $5 million? Well, um, I should say this is a labor of love, really, for Professor Sheldon Pollock. Uh, I'm merely the investor. <laughs> but um, <laughs> That's an important part. <laughs> fair enough. But uh, no, I, you know, I've grown up in India. I grew up in Bangalore. And I went to school where we read history, where uh, we read literature. Um, and in my limited opinion, the, you know, when I sort of look back and reflect on what we, start, what we read, um, there was not sufficient depth in terms of time going back into ancient India, into you know what happened 2,000 years ago in this country, or 1,500 years ago, or 3,000 years ago mm -hmm. even. Um, so in that sense, I'm very interested in how did people live then? How did they write? How did they read? How did mathematics take place? How did science take place? And so on and so forth, you know, philosophy and so on. So that's why I personally am very interested in the classics. I think it, it tells us, it informs us as to what this great civilization, this great land did once upon a time. Um, and so this is one small uh, part of that, 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 uh, that interest uh, in, in classical India. How do you convince people that it's relevant today? Because it is an India in a hurry. It's an aspirational India. They want jobs. Who has the time or the luxury, perhaps, of reading classics? Well, um, it's, you know, I'd, I'd say you should start looking at it in an earlier age even. I mean, we all in school read Shakespeare. I mean, we had time to read Shakespeare. We were required to read Shakespeare. We were required to read Walt Whitman. We were required to read Wordsworth. We were required to read uh, Charles Dickens. Um, and all that I'm saying is, you know, maybe you'd want to consider reading some of these in addition to those texts mm -hmm. uh, as well. So I'd actually start at that age as opposed to saying, you know, how does this help you in adult life, get jobs and so on. Mm -hmm. But more broadly, my own personal view is that this, this helps us also sort of understand where we all come from. It's a shared heritage for all of us. Um, and it's not a bad idea to know where we all come from and what are the great things that happened here. Mm -hmm. Prof uh, Professor Pollock, your labor of love. Yes. But you've talked about a cultural ecocide that is happening. And I think the, mm. perhaps the worrying factor is that no one here seems to care much about it unless we talk about it in some sense of a political narrative or or some muddle thing on who came up with the uh, with Vedic maths first, who or was it European, or was it a West uh, Vedic tradition? It's mm. and that kind of conflict that you see. Right. Why do you think India needs this now more than ever before? I don't know if it's a question of needing it now more than ever before. I mean, India has had a tradition of more than two thousand years mm -hmm. of truly extraordinary um, storytelling and expressive expressive literature and systematic thought, uh, th to lose that treasury would be a loss of extraordinary sadness to the people of India today. Uh, the, the, the rather alarmist term I used of cultural ecocide was simply meant to begin the conversation about what it means to try to recover, conserve, preserve this material. My worry is, and again it's, as I've mentioned to Ron and, other, and others on various occasions, my worry is in, largely anecdotal. I've spent a lot of time in India over the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. I've studied uh, old Kannada. 
I've studied various languages with pundits around the country, and I've seen that the next generation has simply not manifested itself. So there, there seems to be a, a rather dramatic um, moment of discontinuity between the centuries on end of deeply, deeply sympathetic and loving cultivation of forms of knowledge and literature, uh, literature which seem to be at the point now of disappearing. Competences seem to be disappearing. And competences actually can get lost and lost forever. Mm -hmm. Now, why do we really care that these competencies are being lost? I think Rohan's right. In part, learning about where we're going, and I include myself in this we, for reasons I can certainly talk about. Learning about where we're going partly comes from learning about where we have been. Mm -hmm. It's a frame of reference that basically grounds most of our thinking about who we are. If that frame is cloudy or broken or non-existent, then we're diminished as human beings. Mm -hmm. But there's more, you know, there's more than this simply instrumentalized way of thinking about it. First of all, there's a vast array of very beautiful material in those five books. You don't put a price tag on beauty. Uh, beyond, beyond the beautiful, there is something what I would call, refer to as the unfamiliar. The ways, ways of being a human being that have been lost. Those books, those five books, each of them contain both, both recognizable ways of people being people, but also astonishingly unfamiliar, I've used the word strange maybe, in a, maybe <laughs> inappositely, unfamiliar ways of being a human being that I think the world needs to recover. The yes. only options we have are not the ones we've got. Yes. To, uh, to expand our horizons, and uh, Professor Park, if I could bring you in on this, I said yeah. I'm sure you're more used to interviews on <laughs> mathematics, but That's looking right. really, because you've, you've talked so much of uh, how your love for Sanskrit, your learning of Sanskrit, uh, has actually helped you in mathematics. So when we talk about the young people of today, and Rohan made that point that of uh, an education many of us had in English schools, which, which draws on uh, the authors of the West, but completely erases Indian authors or Indian classical authors. Do you think it's time for an actual reversal in this? One day, would you like to see books like this actually being taught in Indian schools? Hi, definitely. I think it's, uh, it's always good to have a number of different perspectives when one is learning. Mm -hmm. And the way education is right now, it's very one track, unidirectional. Uh, as you know, I'm a, I'm a great fan of some of the, the science and mathematics in, in ancient Indian texts. And one of the reasons for that is that the way mathematics is written about in these ancient Indian texts is very different than any other tradition of mathematics. Uh, it's very holistic. It connects to poetry. It connects to music. And in fact, the mathematics is written in poetry mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, with very vivid imagery about nature, about animals, great stories. And when you come to the end of this poetry that you're reading, you realize that you learned a mathematical theorem or a pro mathematical problem was posed uh, that you need to solve. So it makes the mathematics very attractive, very accessible, uh, something that we need <laughs> in our education uh, of mathematics today. And I was lucky to have gotten that when I was a child because my grandfather was a Sanskrit scholar. He had a lot of these mathematics books on his shelf. I loved mathematics. I would pick these up. And I'd be like, whoa, this is a whole different way of doing mathematics. And, and you, didn't, you didn't like school much. I didn't like school <laughs> much, yeah. In fact, I didn't like the traditional way of teaching mathematics. Uh, I, I used to try to skip school, and I would come to Jaipur and learn with my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> and I found that that helped me uh, a great deal, just this different way of, of doing mathematics. Uh, and so, actually, uh, for the future of the series, I, if uh, Professor Pollock allows, <laughs> I'd love for uh, some of these books to be about some of the, uh, the ancient ways of teaching and, propo and uh, proposing mathematics problems that also has a great literary and artistic value. Mm -hmm. And those two things coming together was something that inspired me a lot and influences the way I think today. You made the point about education in India becoming, becoming colonized in a way, and perhaps that big shift happened uh, after we became colonized. But mm -hmm. today, even Sanskrit is potentially such a controversial aspect, and somehow Sansk uh, issue, uh, language like Sanskrit, something like Vedic maths, has all become associated with a regressive right-wing agenda. How, how would someone like you and perhaps uh, those on the table say that we need to rescue this and to look at it as more as an 
Indian topic and not say that anything which is Sanskrit is actually seen as backward and it's opposed to a progressive India. Right, we have to take a middle path, which is not that uh, Sanskrit literature contains everything that you'd ever need to know, that's not true. But to also go the opposite way and say Sanskrit is backward and it doesn't contain anything that's relevant to us today, that's also absolutely incorrect. Uh, or that it's right wing or Hindutva. Yeah, we, I mean, Sanskrit shouldn't be claimed by groups <laughs> or, or rejected by groups. We should look at it for what it is, what it can tell us, what it, how it can uh, be useful to us. It's part of the, the tradition uh, of India and it contains many beautiful things, as Professor Pollock says. And to lose that uh, uh, would be a great sadness because it contains a lot of potential, uh, not just for teaching, but also to recover our, our history, to know ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that reason, it's very important. It doesn't have to be looked at from any religious standpoint or from a <laughs> political standpoint. Mm -hmm. It's pro-India <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's pro-world. Pro, pro this is not just an Indian issue, in fact. Uh, in U.S. universities, uh, every university has a classics department where they teach uh, classics from Latin and Greek literature mm -hmm. and uh, a very popular, very popular department. Uh, people go into many different areas after majoring in classics, but Indian languages are not represented in the classics, despite great student demand. And one of the, one of the reasons for this is that there aren't accessible translations of our ancient Indian texts. Uh, and the Murthy Classical Library is doing a great service by helping to fill this void mm -hmm. uh, to rectify this issue. You know, there are two, there are two uh, things that, uh, that uh, Manjul has just said that are worth stressing. One has to do with Sanskrit, not as the divisive force in Indian history, but Sanskrit as a unifying force. In fact, over its 2,500 or 3,000 year history, Sanskrit has not only brought communities together in many ways, but it's enabled the creation of new forms of expression in the regional languages. This is a story that's absolutely central to the life of Sanskrit, and it's central to the literary and even political life of South Asia. Uh, so Sanskrit has been not a force for division, but a force for unification. So are you surprised when you see the debate at Sanskrit versus Urdu, that, oh, if you teach Sanskrit, why aren't you teaching Kannada, or why aren't you teaching Urdu, or even Sanskrit with versus German, because Sanskrit suddenly came in as a modern Indian language in our curriculum for some schools? The striking thing about classical, the history of classical India is that the either or situation was rarely presented. It was always both and and. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the fact that the classics are taught in American schools, Greek and Latin and French, classical French and classical German, is not only a tribute to the, to the uh, energy and industry and commitment of our faculty and friends in, the, in North America and Europe, but it's, it's something that, could, that, that people in India themselves need to think seriously about. Why couldn't there be more active cultivation of the classical languages in India itself? Here's an interesting case. I was at a conference in Udaipur, I think it was, four or five years ago. Some 90 or 100 of the best literary critics in India who were, were active teachers. And I asked them how many of them had ever taught an Indian language text in their classroom, in that language. Not one person raised his or her hand. Absolutely oh, striking. No. And as I told, uh, as I was saying to Rowan this morning, I'd get given a talk at the opening of the Ashok University. Mm -hmm. 300 brilliant MA students in the, in the class. I asked them how many of them had ever had a sort of an introduction to Indian civilization or had studied Indian classics in there, even in translation. Not a single student raised his or her hand. So they're, you know, Rather than worrying about the hegemonic place of Sanskrit in the world, people should start teaching in an active, loving, serious, consequential way where the true history of Sanskrit and its related languages emerges. Mm -hmm. That would be a true service.